Good morning, everyone. How we doing? Good. Day, day three of the Inspired Home Show 2024. I do hope you've had an opportunity in the first couple days not only to sit in on the education program, and we'll get to that in a second, but to walk the floor. Uh, there's a lot of energy out there. This is a year for new products. Uh, this is a year where I think uh, vendors and retailers are coming together to recognize that the next step in this category, this classification of home and housewares, it just is to start and continue a new growth uh, period. And we're going to talk about growth today. Uh, the theme of this particular session, uh, the, the, the whole week of sessions has been beyond. We've learned about colors that are coming beyond today. We've learned about uh, market data and how that affects what we're going to do beyond today. We've learned about trends, not today's trends, but what the next trends are. And I figured there is no better way to conclude our keynote program this year than to bring Beyond to this stage. Um, but when I was here last year, one of the biggest questions I was confronted with uh, in my role at the IHA and in my role as Homepage News uh, Editor-in-Chief. If you don't know who I am, I'm Peter Gianetti, uh, by the way. I realize I didn't say that initially. The biggest question I got was, what's happening to Bed Bath & Beyond? Well, shortly thereafter, we started to learn what was happening to Bed Bath & Beyond. There were some significant changes beginning with Overstock's acquisition of the uh, Bed Bath & Beyond intellectual property and the relaunch of the bedbathandbeyond.com site uh, in the uh, late summer. Uh, what's interesting is there's been more change, uh, and change is good. And so one of, the initial, one of the questions I'm hearing the most this year is, what's happening to Bed Bath & Beyond. And I think today we're gonna uh, learn a little bit about that from our two speakers. Um, they're going to discuss the aggressive growth plans of Beyond Inc., which was the new corporate name of Overstock after they acquired Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond is an important part of that and, and a flagship part of that strategy, but you're gonna hear about the return of Overstock.com. You're going to hear about the launch of additional e-commerce sites that sort of play into this whole idea of home as a hub, home as a center of living, home as a center of family. Uh, and it's with that, I have uh, two very special guests. I'm going to read a little bit about them uh, so you can get a head start. They may want to tell you a little bit more. Marcus Lamonis is the executive chairman of Beyond Inc., he joined the Beyond Board of Directors as co-chair uh, in November of 2023. And you may know that Marcus honed his entrepreneurial spirit while working at his family's automotive dealership. And at the age of 25, he seized the opportunity to reshape the way recreational vehicles and outdoor equipment were sold. Under his leadership and vision, Camping World would grow to become the nation's largest RV retailer. Lamonis next set out as host of his own TV show the hit CNBC series, The Profit. It ran for eight years, and Marcus helped turn around and improve businesses across the way. It spawned several spinoffs, uh, including Street of Dreams, where Marcus, uh, edu educating himself and viewers about the financial workings of key industries. Our other speaker is Chandra Holt. Chandra is the new kid on the block in uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. She was named CEO just about a month ago, is that right? Uh, Chandra has over two decades of experience serving in various leadership roles across retail, e-commerce, merchandising, and brand management. She has an extensive background leading complex e-commerce and omnichannel transformations and significant knowledge of the retail industry supply chain, technology, private brands, and marketing. Chandra served from 2021 to 2022 as CEO and president of Cons Home Plus. Uh, prior to joining Cons, Holt was Executive Vice President of E-Commerce at Walmart. She also served as COO of Sam's Club and held several other executive leadership positions for Sam's Club. She also has held leadership roles at Walgreen and Target. With that, I would love to introduce Marcus Lamonis to the stage. We're going to hear from Chandra. Chandra, can you just stand up so everyone can just take a look at there? Thank you very much. Marcus, I'm a little overwhelmed by Chandra's resume. Uh, I sell RVs, and she's conquered the world in the home space. So um, I think you know one of the things that was important when I joined the Beyond organization was to find a leader that I felt embodied uh, what the company needed to become. 
I want to take a step back and give everybody a little insight on why I ended up getting involved in the company. Um, a couple of them are going to seem a little odd to you. For those mothers in the room, you'll have an appreciation for it. For those guys, you may not care. Um, but there's three primary reasons that I decided to get involved in the business. One, I felt like the business was headed in the wrong direction. And as an e-commerce platform provider, seller of goods and services, you have a distant relationship from the consumer. You never get to see them, you never get to touch them, you never get to interact with them other than a click and a ship and a box and a delivery. And for me, uh, that's a tough proposition to begin with. Secondly, the acquisition of Bed Bath & Beyond was somewhat inspiring for me. I, um, I come from an orphanage in Beirut, Lebanon. I was adopted by a wonderful, wonderful uh, family that lived in Miami, Florida. For those moms in the room, I'm an only child. You may have picked up on that already. Uh, and both my parents have passed away. And I'm a sentimental kid. And I used to go with my mother every week to Bed Bath & Beyond before we would go to eat tacos and she would have a margarita. And that was our routine. And I would say to her, what are we going there for? She goes, I don't know. They have everything. We're going to find something. And so nostalgia is a big part. And when the company uh, was in trouble, uh, it was concerning to me. I did a show for HDTV about two years ago. And uh, Overstock elected not to help me with the show. And Bed Bath & Beyond did. And Bed Bath & Beyond was in financial trouble. So I made it my mission to do everything I could to help that brand at least stay alive. And then when it became available, my motivation uh, was pretty clear. The third and maybe most important is that in all of my years in working with businesses, particularly small businesses, there was one key element that was a common thread that caused every business to fail. And that was that their home life wasn't right. And what I realized over time, particularly in doing the HG show, was that the home is the center point of everything that happens in an individual's life. And how they are at home usually uh, affects how they behave outside of the home. If their life isn't right, and their life with their family isn't right, and their house isn't set up right, their mind gets twisted. And they end up doing silly and, and, and ridiculous things. So if you take yourself back to 1987, for those of you that may have been alive in 1987, there was this wonderful movie that came out. And at the end of that movie, you, you were uh, driving in the car as if you were the driver. The POV was you were looking out the front windshield. And it was a brown neighborhood. All the houses were brown. The sky was brown. Everything was brown. And there was one home that had a bubble over it. Entire bubble, and the purpose of that bubble was to keep bad things from coming in and bad things from leaving. And that movie was E.T. And the reason that I use that reference in that visual is because we recalibrated the company in the last 90 days to be everything inside the four walls of the property, excuse me, the four corners of the property and the four walls of the house. The business needed a focus. And it needed a deliberate focus that explained both to the consumer, the buyers, the merchants, uh, and the vendors, most importantly, how that business would interact going forward. And it, it historically had tried to be everything to everybody. And the greatest recipe for failure is that you try to do that. So when we outlined the four corners of the property, much like you would look at a Google Earth image, you would see those four corners and you would see those four walls. And that applies to whether somebody is a homeowner, which is the greatest accomplishment, I think, financially in one person's life, or a renter. And how did this company, um, how does this company reconfigure itself in a way that the Overstock brand has had a lot of challenges with it. I today can tell you explicitly what it will become, but historically it went from an off-price retailer to a regular price retailer to a markup, markdown retailer to selling clothes and jewelry and furniture and everything in between, and it didn't really have a brand identity. In that process, the company, I believe, wanted to have a brand identity. 
and it went out and it acquired the most important, in my opinion, the most important asset that existed in the marketplace in terms of intellectual property, which is Bed Bath & Beyond. When we go and we think about bedbathandbeyond.com, we can't resist to take ourselves through our walking steps inside the store. I can tell you to this day that I know exactly where everything was. I know that planogram like the back of my hand because I walked it for 40 years. But we didn't really explain to the vendor community how we were going to bring that to life. And so the primary catalyst of me getting involved was in the fall of 2023, the company acquired the IP, I wasn't there, and they made the death blow decision to turn Overstock off. They literally just turned it off. They took $1.6 billion of revenue and they just said, no, nope, that doesn't work. And what they did is they took the website and they literally painted it blue and changed the logo. And what happened was is that the historical categories that had done very well, furniture, rugs, big, big average order items, were not necessarily corollary with what Bed Bath did. I know for certain that when I went into Bed Bath, I saw very little furniture. I would see maybe some stackable tables and some chairs, some cafe tables, uh, a 4th of July stuff, right behind the checkout, right back there. But I never saw sectionals, armoires, rugs, mattresses, bed frames. I just didn't think about it. And when the company did that, the Overstock customer arrived at the party that they normally went to every single day, and they knocked on the door, and the people that answered the door were different. And they didn't tell anybody why. So they lost a subset of customers. And then they took the Bed Bath customer that historically, like myself, known the brand really well and knew what I was going to get there. Everything for the bedroom, everything for the bathroom, everything for the kitchen, and a bunch of other little tchotchkes and a big tub of cheese balls. Oh, that was their number one snack item. Big tub of cheese balls. It was like a big deal. The problem was you got to the Bed Bath & Beyond site and all you saw was like lots of furniture and nobody correlated the two. So in December of 2023, like less than 90 days ago, I uh, kicked down the door. And uh, for those of you that are in the industry, my arrival to the company was less than conventional. I came through an activist investor and pushed all the idiots out of the room. And I have no problem saying that. Because when you take legacy brands and you destroy them, you're not just destroying your business, but you're affecting the livelihood of those vendors and suppliers who pay their bills and feed their family and bought inventory and made decisions off of a premise. And for me, that was more agitating. And the only reason that I wanted to come to this show, and I'm going to walk the show later, is to communicate clearly to the vendor community that you are our number one customer. And that's not a popular thing to say with a traditional customer, a true customer. But if the relationship with the vendors isn't healthy and you're not providing pathways to profitability for those vendors and pathways to improve turns in inventory, which are a big focus for all of us, and margin that goes with it, which is essentially business, turns and margin, then you have destroyed that relationship. And you can go out to great dinners at Gibson's and do all sorts of fun events, but at the end of the day, everybody in this building is here to do one particular thing. Build wealth for themselves and their families and for their company. And any strategy that disputes that is a strategy that needs to be, I think, eliminated. So in this process, we have started to think about the types of, of brands that we're going to create. Now, I want you to take yourself back to that ET visual. The reason that the company is named Beyond is because I didn't want to make a single commitment to one specific brand. It's a gallery of brands. And the idea behind it was to build a grid. So if you can visualize a, a true grid that would have every homeowner or renter in America placed somewhere in that grid, regardless of what their income was, their age was, their gender, their race, anything, they would find themselves somewhere on that grid. 
And over time, we would build the gallery of brands from luxury all the way down to deep off-price flash sales that would allow us to talk to everybody. And over time, if you give the customer and the vendor a great experience, you're going to build trust. And if you build trust, then the portfolio companies do fine. But what the real secret sauce is, is your ability to sell those consumers products and services that extend all the way to mortgages and insurance because you've built trust. So the North Star of the company is to be a great commerce business, great vendor relationships, but ultimately to build the database of trust that you can sell all these other financial products and services to them at a below market price because your primary business isn't built on, uh, isn't built on financial services, it's built on commerce. The challenge was, do we have the right people in our organization to do that? We wanted to acquire Zulily. We acquired that, I think, two weeks ago or something like that. And the story is, I'll have to see you at a bar to tell you the story of how we got it. It was not a conventional story. And we're looking to make other acquisitions, including potentially even a very small footprint brick and mortar business. Because Chandra believes that omni-channel is a necessity, including last mile delivery and other things that I think she's smart unbelievably smart, and you'll hear from her in a minute. The key in my mind is, is that you can buy a bunch of brands. You can own Overstock and Bed Bath. You can launch Backyard.com, which we are, Baby and Beyond, which we are, Kids and Beyond, which we are. We will launch a competitor to Sir Latab and William Sonoma. Uh, hopefully, I can get Chandra to do it quicker than maybe we're supposed to. Uh, but the goal is to do all of those things, and owning brands and owning vendor relationships is not even half the battle. It's like 20% of the battle. Having excellent people who understand the marketplace, who think like the consumer, and sorry guys in the men, room, men in the room, you're not the consumer. You are the potential part payer of it, and we may let you decide a few things, but at the end of the day, my mother, your mother, your mother, those are the consumers. And so the goal is to really build the executive team that looks like the consumer. You'll see more board members be added. If I had my way, I would have all women, and then they would allow me to stay. And then the management team would be all women, and maybe they would allow me to stay. But at the end of the day, you can't build a business that serves a particular demographic and then think that if you don't, and, and think that you can communicate to them and, and, and engage with them in a language other than what they speak. So with that, um, I had the chance to draft Michael Jordan. For those of you that are, everybody in the room knows Michael Jordan. If you want to play basketball, you get Michael Jordan. And if you want to bring Bed Bath & Beyond back to its glory, you hire and recruit and beg and beg some more Chandra Holt to come help you with your business. So with that, Chandra. Thanks, Marcus. I, I appreciate the introduction. Um, as Marcus said, I'm Chandra Holt. I'm the new CEO of Bed Bath & Beyond. I've been in role for just over a month. And as you can tell from, from what Marcus said, it's been an exciting month. So our team is really busy rebuilding the Bed Bath & Beyond business. We're less than two weeks away from relaunching Overstock. And as Marcus said, we recently acquired Zulily. So we've got a lot going on, a lot to be excited about. But as Marcus mentioned, when you take a step back and look at what we're trying to do, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, we're trying to really own the home, own those four corners. And we're gonna do that by appealing to various customer segments and providing them with unmatched with an unmatched value proposition across all the different segments. So if you look at our, our company today, we have two main tiers. So we have a mainstream tier with Bed Bath and & Beyond. Um, and, and here we are looking to really rebuild the Bed Bath business, going after the key categories that we were dominant in in the past. So bedding, 
kitchen, tabletop, housewares, you know, all the things that you expect Bed Bath & Beyond to have. Um, so we'll rebuild those categories. We'll have assortments that are very broad. We wanna make sure that our customers can find what they want when they come to the site. But we'll, we'll, we'll curate the depth so that when customers receive something from Bed Bath & Beyond, they know it's gonna be a high quality product. Today in, in e-commerce, there's so many experiences out there where you kind of cross your fingers and hope you get something and it's not, you know, it, it is what you think it is. And when our customers shop Bed Bath & Beyond, we want to make sure that they know they're going to get really great high quality products. Um, you see on this slide that there's a lot of other brands um, that we have on here that we're working on. So we know our, our customers have other needs and those needs we feel will be better met with specialized experiences. So if you're a new mom shopping at Baby and Beyond, we wanna make sure you have a, a great experience. And so we're, we're setting up a specialized experience there. If you have a, a, a child going to college or if you're going to college, College Living will be a great place for you. Um, Kids and Beyond is another experience that we're setting up. Backyard.com, so um, you know, how many people love cornhole? There's a lot of people who do, so we're gonna make sure we get after that. Um, so that's kind of our mainstream business today. Um, from an economic value proposition, we will be competitively priced, um, and we'll use rewards such as our coupons to provide our customers, um, our, especially our loyal customers, um, extra value as they shop with us more and more. Uh, the other tier that we're, we're, we're working on really rigorously is um, our, our off-price brands. So this, our main brand that we're, we're, we're really close to launching is Overstock. And this is really, really exciting because as Marcus mentioned, Overstock kind of lost its way over time. It started out as this business that was a true, you know, 30 to 70% off MSRP. And over time, it became a kind of a mainstream brand and it didn't really have you know, a winning value proposition and started to decline over time. So now that we've got this bed bath business that we're building and we're relaunching Overstock, we have an opportunity with Overstock to launch it as a true Overstock business. It'll be anchored in the economic value proposition around that you know, high percent off MSRP. So anything on the site, you'll see the pricing will be, you know, you, you'll open the site and right away you'll see everything, you know, for 30 to 70% off. Um, and that's how the pricing will work. And so we're going after those true, um, really strong, crazy, I think Marcus calls it crazy stupid deals for our customers. And there's a, a big segment of customers out there who love this space. I mean, look at how well some of the brick and mortar retailers are doing, um, TJX, Ross, you look at their earnings releases every quarter and they're doing an incredible job. But in the e-commerce world, there's not really that person out there owning that space. And re-anchoring overstock in the space will be a great way for us to really start to be a leader here. And then you've got Zulily, which is another way to, get, to really serve customers with the flash sales. If you talk to Zulily customers, they are so passionate about the brand. They would get up at six in the morning to figure out you know, what was on sale that day or get the new, the new thing that's coming out. So we're really excited about both of these brands and to really serve our customers in a unique and unmatched way from everyone else that's out there in, in the market. Um, as Marcus mentioned, um, you know, there could be more bubbles on this chart at some day, or someday. Um, in fact, there, there will be, um, or else, you know, I might not have a job for much longer, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, he said, you know, getting into luxury with tabletop. So we're always looking at, you know, where there's unmet customer demand and where we can provide value that's not out there. So um, we're at an exciting time with our brands as they are today. We have a lot of work to do, but there's, there's likely more to come. And as Mar Marcus mentioned before I leave this slide, um, we have launched a site called Beyond Plus, which is our services site. And all of our brands will be tied to these services. So our customers, as they build trust with us through commerce, will also be able to engage with our services platform um, and also our loyalty platform. All right, so back to, be back to Bed, Bath and Bed Bath & Beyond. So, as Marcus mentioned, we launched Bed Bath & Beyond you know, six-ish months ago with kind of the overstock categories as the leaders. And what the customers told us were that's a little bit weird. Um, and so the team that we have here at the show is doing a phenomenal job getting back to our roots, getting back to those categories that really drive the value proposition. 
So as I mentioned before, we will have a very broad assortment. So we wanna make sure that whatever kitchen widget our customers are looking for, they're gonna find it on our site. But we will curate that depth and we will make sure that the products that are coming from Bed Bath & Beyond are high quality. So there's not this question that I'm gonna get something inferior when I buy it from Bed Bath & Beyond. So question I get a lot is, okay, how do you, how do you become a great supplier for Bed Bath & Beyond? So it starts with doing the basics. So the basics, we wanna have the right assortment, we wanna be competitively priced, we wanna have a direct relationship with you, because that helps our economics and it should help your economics as well. And we wanna have amazing content. And I can't tell you how important content is. Because you think, okay, you know, assortment, price, and the relationship, that's the basics. In e-commerce, content is king. Content is so important. It helps drive traffic to your items. It helps convert the customer when they're looking at buying your items. And it helps cut down on returns, which it sounds like a funny thing, but who likes dealing with returns? No one likes returns, right? And so the more information, the more the customer can have knowledge about what they're buying, the more it'll help sell your products and the more it'll help the customers keep your products they know what they're getting. So that's the base, that's kind of the baseline. So once you kind of get your baseline set up with us, we've got the right products, the right assortment, we have the right relationship, um, and we've got great content, um, we want you to promote your products. And we have uh, several different ways for you to do that. So working with our teams to do vendor-funded promotions, our customers love deals, so we're happy to work with you on, on doing deals on your items. Um, we have opportunity for sponsored search and display ads. So um, we have, Katie, if you want to wave, wave your hand. If anyone wants to um, invest in driving promotions for the business, we have one of our best here today with Katie, and I'm sure she'd love to answer your questions today. Um, so we'd love to help you with that. So get your core proposition, get your core item set up, start promoting them, make sure you have great content. And then the last thing is execution. Execution is super important to building trust with our customers. One of the things that we will start tracking very diligently is NPS for our customers. And we will track that across the entire customer journey. We recently just promoted our chief product officer, Carlisha Robinson, to be the chief customer officer. And her job is to track our experience across the entire customer journey take defects out of the system, and make sure that our experience is top notch. And one of the things that I've found in every role I've had leading e-commerce is I can go on my site and fix the bugs and do things to make the shopping experience easier. That's actually the easy piece and, the, and kind of an easy way to, to grow MPS. But the bigger opportunity generally is with the suppliers. Because when a package shows up you know, crushed, or you know, the, the product isn't what the customer wanted, or the, you know, the product is crushed, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a frustrating experience. So we will track NPS for all of our suppliers, and you will hear from us if you're not meeting our customer's expectation. Um, and we wanna help you get better. A lot of times it's just different packaging. A lot of times you're not, you know, your content isn't right. So we will be very solution oriented with you, but we will be very, 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 um, focus on that post-delivery NPS with you because it's very important to our customers and it's important to building trust. So um, if you're not a supplier, the good news is that we have a very um, quick process for you to get set up as a supplier. So um, I don't need to walk you through this whole thing, but basically if you just go to bedbathandbeyond.com slash partner, you fill out an application and then we kind of get you going through, through the journey. So um, with that, I think that's the, the end of my, my remarks. Um, I think we're gonna open it up for questions and we'd love to, to hear from you. Kendra, thank you so much. Marcus, thanks so much. I will be managing the Q&A from back here, but before we take a question from the audience, I have a, first of all, I wanna learn about the Zulily deal, so where do you wanna have a drink later on? Okay, uh, and Chandra. You, Marcus made a comment about how much you think omni-channel is an important part of the total equation. And maybe you can or can't get specific. Obviously, one of the questions since Overstock acquired Bed Bath & Beyond assets uh, last year is, is there a plan 
to bring Bed Bath and Beyond stores back into the mix? Is there a demand for that? And secondly, uh, what other what, what other um, what is the one thing you think your customer, the Bed Bath and Beyond customer, really really wants? That might be a little different than what they're used to getting. She can answer all of them except one of those questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take it. Uh, there is no plan for our company to spend our dollars bringing Bed Bath & Beyond back in brick and mortar where we sign leases and open locations. That model financially just doesn't work. There is a model that could work, and Chandra and Dave did a great job of uh, establishing a licensing partner in Mexico and a potential licensing partner in the UAE and some version of that around the world outside of the US. But from a US standpoint, we will look for a very strategic way to bring Bed Bath & Beyond ba the brand back and a small assortment back into the marketplace for consumers to grab it and touch it, but it won't be on leases that we take on. Got it. What about the question of what, what the Bed Bath & Beyond consumer may want that they're not getting, or dare I say coupons? I don't know if that's a, a dirty word or not uh, right now. <laughs> Go ahead. You know, right now, we, we have, we're not doing the job we need to do on assortment. So we don't have the assortment that we will have once our team is, is done getting through the development process that, that the Bed Bath & Beyond customer is used to having. So you should be able to come to us, and if you're looking for bath towels, we should be the best and easiest place to shop. Um, if you're looking for, you know, new sheets or new bedding, or you're looking to register for your, your wedding and, and get all of your housewares, we should be the best place to go. So we have a long, hopefully not a super long journey, but a journey ahead of us to deliver that core value proposition um, that our customers are used to. Um, so I think that's, that's the biggest thing. And then our customers, you said it, they love their coupons. So um, we will, you know, right now we have a combination of kind of this thing we call site sale, which is just kind of your, you know, red line price off, and then we have coupons. And we will, we will move more towards the coupons because that's what our, our customers, they love those 20% off coupons. They do. So, yeah. so, yeah. I think I still have a whole drawer full yeah. of them. Uh, I get my, so many stories of people like, them out. Yeah. <laughs> walk around with a 20% off coupon, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyone want a question for Marcus or Chandra? Hang on, I'll come on over. Hey, uh, so first of all, that was really a breath of fresh air, I think, um, focusing on the vendor uh, and vendor relations and really making us a partner in the process. Um, I come from the world of Amazon and selling things on Amazon where that is not the case and things are getting really kind of crazy over there in terms of fees and things like that. Um, but my question to you is, um, you know, the presentation talks about having lower prices and enforcing lower prices and, you know, giving us a great place to get rid of lower prices, getting great margins. How is that possible in a world where, you know, Amazon will take away our buy box if you have a lower price on your site? As much as we'd love to give it to you and sell to you, how do you reconcile that and how do you make that work in this world when there's such a, such a big volume of online sales? Well, first of all, we need you to have a higher uh, belief in the value of your product, where Amazon doesn't have to be the only place that you sell it. And I think that starts with uh, suppliers having confidence in the R&D and the development of the product and the packaging and in the quality of materials. Because if not, then it's just going to be a race to the bottom called Timu. That's really what it's going to become. And if you've bought anything from them, it is a fun place to shop until you get it. So that's number one. Number two, the goal is to create a stratified opportunity where there are different places for you to put your product based on where it is in the life cycle. And if you believe that you have a glut of inventory, that best place may not be Bed Bath & Beyond or the upper tier. It may be overstock. And if it's more extreme than that, it goes on to Zulily. The strategy with Zulily, a lot of people are not familiar with. It is not a place where a vendor has to worry about that price being visible to the marketplace. It is an email registration membership site where 18 million people are members of that site today, and that product gets uploaded and they get notified that there's a flash sale. So we want to protect the brand. We think Amazon, in some cases, is going to be the juggernaut forever. The question is, is that the right place for your brand? It may be in some cases, but it can't be the only place. Of my sales, it's hard to jeopardize that. 
They're 90% of your sales. Is that where you put 90% of your effort? Probably. Okay. Yeah. And then, then that's it. But we're going to do $2 billion this year. That's a small amount. Wayfair is going to do $10, $11, $12 billion. So there is $13 billion happening that doesn't look like that. I think if I was in your shoes, I would start to creep up a couple percentage points and spread them around where you're not taking too much risk for your family, but you're testing and sampling what other things could do. But small, be careful. The other, the other thing with Amazon, so I mean, we're kind of tied to this, you know, we have bots scraping prices, like we all do it, right? So you kind of have that set price in the market. And, and for us, you know, at, at Bed Bath, we can provide value through our rewards program, which is not something that can be really scraped. And so that's another way that we can, we can work with you to, to promote your brands. And I will say, like, it is, I mean, Amazon will do a lot of volume, but again, it's dog eat dog. And you know, you're one of thousands and thousands where, as I said, at Bed Bath, we will have a broad assortment. But that depth is going to be curated for the, the best, right? And so if you can be the best, you could end up doing as much, if not more, hopefully more volume on Bed Bath being a top supplier. One thing that maybe got lost in, um, in that one chart that showed the gallery of brands, Chandra and I had this when we first started working together, she's like, well, you have all these brands, backyard and kids and college living. And I said, listen, I, I believe that the next generation of buyers loves curated experiences. And when you can take uh, outdoor patio furniture, above ground spas, grills, outdoor kitchens, things for your pool, uh, backyard games, and you can focus them in backyard.com and put the money behind it, it's a more curated experience. Most people in this room, when they went to college, their mother or father took them to Bed Bath & Beyond and they got everything they needed. We don't want that experience. When you're not in a store, that experience needs to be curated. So we have college living. And that's going to be a bottom up from campus up model. So you have to figure out ways to enter the marketplace that are a little more curated and that that consumer knows exactly why they're going there and what they're going to get. If I go to Amazon today for college things, I don't get the Bed Bath & Beyond original I'm going to college checklist that all of us had. Like, how do you know what to get? Yes, ma'am. We got to get you a mic. Well, th this woman was... Oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I, I, I couldn't see the light. That's okay. I was just wondering on the vendor side, how is that going to look in terms of all the different websites? How does that look in, like, do we still enter it in the same portal and then you guys push yeah. it to the separate they side? They want Deb for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, for, so for... I'll, yeah, you can, you can, I'll, I'll do the high level and you can give the, give the, so, so the, the only thing I want to say is like having a whole bunch of experiences shouldn't mean that you have to manage a whole circus of things, right? And so our goal and the way that we're setting up our merchandising organization is so that, and our, and our supplier support organization is that you don't, you can just contact, you have one contact and they will help you figure out like where your items go across the different brands um, versus you having to reach out to like a whole bunch of different people. So Deb, I'll, I'll let you take it from there. Is my mic on? Yep. Um, the only thing I'll add on to that is not only will you have one contact. Yourself, oh, sorry, Deb awesome Baum. Part. I'm the chief merchandising officer. So I have responsibility both for Bed Bath and Overstock. So my team will also help you kind of wayfind what's the right fit for each product, but then we have one supplier oasis system, so one portal. So you won't have to set up your items multiple times or yourself as a vendor multiple times. So once you're in that portal, then you'll direct certain items towards each site in partnership with our team. But yeah, one supplier setup. Okay, hi, Adele here. Um, I was wondering how will things change for partners that have already been, suppliers that have already been working with Bed Bath and Overstock who've had such volatility throughout this process and what will change for them in the process of getting back onboarded and getting their assortment up and all of those things that are so important to getting our sales back in line with these platforms? Yeah. So I think it depends on what your current contact is. Um, if you have a contact on the merchant team, they would be able to help you wayfind that. If you don't currently, 
grab me either after the meeting or something, and I can get you connected with our business development team, which is also what you'd get with when she talked about Bed Bath & Beyond slash partner. Um, Amy Peck was at the show with a number of people from her team. She's fantastic at managing kind of that intake process and make sure you get connected up with the right people. But my yeah, email. we know people need to reactivate as we make changes in our strategy. My email is marcus, marcus at beyond.com. And I give that out freely. And there's a team of people that also get to receive those. If you have an experience that isn't great, that'll go to this team because we want to make it easy for people to navigate. Mm -hmm. We don't want you to have to figure out what the labyrinth looks like because it's complicated. Absolutely. Hi. Uh, I have a question. So what, would you, what advice would you give a small brand that has access to some unique nor sources? I decided to be a little selfish and ask you kind of a personal question. No, but it's a good one. Um, it is a good question, I mean, at least for me. And uh, we're kind of at this point, we're a small brand. We have a really unique history. We have a decent distribution. We have flagging sales, um, but we also have some unique resources. But we're kind of in this space where we're not really sure what to do. Do we take a uh, volume to price proposition and kind of play that game and go very big? Or do we do a niche kind of unique model and kind of carve out like a, a, a special market for us where we do like a, yeah, I don't know if you have something to add to that, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm asking somewhere in the middle. Like, what do we do? I mean, I always would go for where can you offer something unique? You know, I used to always, when I was a merchant, it was as simple as kind of quality, cost, speed, but where, where can you offer something? So if you look at the marketplace and what's out there today, I would focus on where you think you have something better to offer. And that could be something better in terms of, is it the quality of the product, the functionality? I can offer better cost. I have it in the US and everybody else is getting it from China, so I offer more speed. I would personally say, look for where your niche is. But I have a feeling Marcus, as a business coach, will have a, uh, an answer there too. I'm definitely <laughs> not a coach. Uh, uh, I, 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 my team would not be doing well. Um, I would do both. Uh, we all have bills to pay, and so when you look at your business today, I would do both. When you look at your business today, you have certain SG&A that you need to take care of. You have payroll and rent and all these things, and you need to find the sure thing that's going to give you the volume and the contribution margin to satisfy the expense structure. For me, the niche piece is the gravy on top, and over time, as you curate a niche assortment, those things will then, some of them will then make it into the volume bucket. Almost like you know it's going to work, you need the volume, you think it could work, you need to test it, and as the test starts to perform, it may go into the volume category. But that's ultimately how I would want you to structure your P&L. Because if you play the wrong game at the end of the month, at the end of the year, or at the end of the quarter, you're out of cash. And so you have to be mindful. you got to turn your inventory and you need margin. And you're going to hear me say it to this industry over and over again. It doesn't focus enough. And I know that there's people that aren't going to like that I say it. But this industry doesn't focus enough on turns and margins together. That's the perfect Jim Roy. And if you've never heard that term, it's gross margin return on investment of a specific product. And it, it calculates the margin and the turn in the same thesis. That's missing in this industry, which is why we end up with big warehouses of stuff that we don't know what to do with. We're happy as an off-price retailer, but if you told me that the entire industry fixed that process over time and that off-price would drop and first price would improve, I would be perfectly happy with that. Why would my brand get diluted with that strategy? No, it doesn't have to be separate. Like we're a niche kind of old, like our brand started in 1944, and we can't do like a high volume price to get that margin. You would do some high volume, low price, and you would do some regular. And I think you got to find the perfect balance between what's going to pay the bills and what's going to give you new innovative ideas. Because at some point, what pays are the SKUs that are in your what pays the bills category? If you rank them from, if there was 10 of them, usually 20% of them are going to cycle out over time. Yeah, yeah. And you got to have enough development over here to fill the bucket. And unfortunately, it doesn't go like this. It goes like this, and then it leaves. And so this flywheel has to be working at all times in terms of product development. 
And I've seen a number of businesses similar to how you've described yours that just fade away because they don't do enough of this. We're, we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can, but I want to kind of move it on. This gentleman here, though. Uh, hi, my name is Harish. Uh, this uh, question is for Marcus. Uh, Marcus, I had uh, read an article some time back uh, that probably was one of your statements, and correct me, I could be wrong, that there was a good focus on getting vendors who are on Etsy, you know, handcrafted and handmade. So if you'd like to throw some light on that, and then secondly to Chandra and the team, is there any focus on Fair trade, sustainability, organic, I mean, is there any separate section, anything you'd like to highlight on that, that piece? I'll take the first part. Um, my comment about Etsy is uh, uh, I probably could have simplified it. In the business strategy that I would like us to have across our gallery of brands, we have large, massive brands like Newell or Conair or whatever they may be. But there has to be a perfect balance of smaller emerging brands. And I don't believe that competitors to us do a nice enough job creating a marketplace for the smaller innovative brands. That doesn't mean that they have to be tucked away in some little site. That means that they have to be given equal position, equal prominence, equal expectation, and equal standards, but they have to be given a chance. And when I look at the immersion of new brands, we have to have a, a, a protocol in our company that a certain percentage of the brands that we bring on are new emerging brands. New emerging brands can also be defined as small businesses. Mm -hmm. And there has to be a home for small business because every big business that's at this show started as a small business. We want to be the discoverer of new ideas and the discoverer of new brands. And we need to create a, a portion of all of those sites that don't call it out. And that's one of the things that I don't like to do. I don't like to call out small businesses if they're, you know, some special needs situation. I like to call it out by giving them the same access that the big brands have. But if they can't hang on the cost of goods side, on the margin performance side, on the delivery side, on the quality side, on the customer service side, then we need to coach them up. So one of the things that we have not disclosed to the marketplace yet that I will do today is that we are creating a vendor and trade business, I don't want to call it coaching process, but we are going to create a little bit of an educational platform. Because if I look at the, the trade business, which buys a lot of the products and sells them, they need to learn how to manage their business better. If I look at the small businesses that are trying to figure out how to manage their cash flow or manage their inventory, they need to do that. So I've put together 120 different courses that will be accessible through this platform where people that have questions on how to improve their business will be able to access them if they are a vendor or supplier to the company. If they are not, they will not have access. Over here, Marcus, one over here. We just need to finish I can quickly address the one oh, second piece of your question, but then I'm gonna let us go. So on the eco and fair trade, we do realize how important that is. We don't currently have a section of our website. I think it speaks to what Chandra was talking about. We have a big opportunity to curate better, but we do intake that as part of the item setup is, is something we put into the attributes that we have for the product, but I, I, we have an opportunity to do a better job helping the customers that that's important to find it. Hold on. Do, do you have time for a couple more questions? I do, yeah. And will you be able to stick around for a little bit if somebody wants to see you or no? Or I need to walk the trade the show. Or the team. Let's, we're we got we're walking the trade show I apologize together. if I can't get to everyone, but let's, we'll do my best to get the next couple in. Hi, thank you. I'm Christy. Um, question as I put myself in consumer shoes and thinking about how things have been over the past few years. Can you share more about the plan that you have as you build this gallery of brands, driving, reaching shoppers, driving traffic back to these sites, building the trust that you talked about? How are you going to bring them away from where they may have settled in at Amazon, at Walmart.com, et cetera? There's a lot of competition out there. Can I split the answer? Sure. OK. Chandra uh, is going to take the technical side, but the way that we market today as a company, we're predominantly a performance marketer. And what that means is we spend money on the internet looking for customers and buying business. And ultimately, there's no affinity or relationship being established. One of the things that you'll see us do in the coming 24 months is take a subset of our, con of our budget and dedicate it exclusively to content. 
And I'm not talking about the content that the vendors in this building have, where they make little videos of people using their product. We will be in the long form content business, creating probably seven to eight television shows that are acutely focused on the gallery of brands and the products that fill them, using that content as funnel marketing. And when that show airs on Netflix or Bravo or wherever it's going to air, we will take that long form content and cut it up into 30, 60, 90, and 120 forms to create true funnel marketing with personalities as part of the brands. Known personalities, expert personalities. The content that we're talking about creating is very splashy, very edgy, and very right now. And a lot of people aren't going to love it because it's not earnest. We're not going to give everybody a new car. This isn't Oprah. <laughs> the idea is, is to drive home a point. I'll, I'll give you a ridiculous example that is in process. And, uh, and she may not like that I'm disclosing this, but we are working with Dale Earnhardt and his wife, Amy, who is a fantastic designer, and working with them together on the launch of Backyard.com and creating content around that and building a line of patio furniture around her and her design aesthetics. When you deliver that sort of content and it's useful, helpful, and it resonates with an audience, you're creating a funnel. And we believe that ultimately the price still has to be great. The value still has to be unbelievable and the perceived value has to be even better. But we will use content. Yeah, so I think Marcus did a great job talking about the marketing side of it. The one thing I will, will add in is the spaces that we're going to plan are, have a lot of white space. So we're, we're, we're going to you know, get our customers excited with the marketing that, that Marcus talked about, but we're going to also attract them and keep them through our value proposition. So like I said, there's not a big leader in off price right now. That's why we're leaning in there. There's no one really owning the historical Bed Bath & Beyond categories, which is why we know we can grow a lot of business there. And whatever other sites or experiences or brands we set up, we will do that with the lens of making sure we're going into a place where there's white space and there's a, there's a clear path to winning. Um, and we think that will help kind of keep those customers sticky and coming back to us. Yes. I saw you taking pictures. That was very astute. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, congratulations on making uh, undervalued acquisition of Bed Bath & Beyond and Zoo Lily. I think the uh, transactions were brilliant and wish you well on that. Uh, I'd like to know uh, more about your strategy long term in terms of taking uh, a leadership position in uh, distribution in response to customer orders and uh, in particular taking Bed Bath & Beyond to a level beyond what they had ever uh, considered in the way of warehousing and distribution, and I think they lost out big time as a result of that. I can take that, yeah. Please. So the, the, the one thing I forgot to mention on one of my slides is we do have a, a service for uh, distribution today. So we do have, um, we are asset light, but we do do some warehousing. So if you're a supplier that doesn't do dropship on your own, we do have, um, a service called Supplier Oasis Fulfillment Service, so we can do that. Um, and as we build out these businesses, we'll look at you know how we distribute to you know offer you know to make sure it makes sense financially for ourselves and for our suppliers. You know if we would, uh, Marcus alluded to getting back into brick and mortar um, through you know other ways and opening our own stores. But you know, we can, when we do get, if we do get back into brick and mortar, we can use that as micro fulfillment centers. Um, there's a lot of creative ways to serve the customers quickly and efficiently. Um, and we just need to build that as we're building up our business. Deb, you want to add anything to that? The only thing that I would add is we are trying to also look at a way for the college um, living site, how do we get back into the campuses to help make that process of shipping directly into your campus work better? So we are looking at a couple partnership opportunities to do that, because that was a huge strength of Bed Bath & Beyond. So I think we'll look for those kind of partnerships where they make sense. That's just one example. But we know that kind of taking some of the friction away for our partners is a way we can differentiate. I want to end on one, one, I want to end on one last comment around your question, sir. Uh, when I think about the ultimate consumer, 
um, I think about the elasticity of pricing. And in the last 24 months, inflation has taken some goods up as much as 18 to 35%. And every time you do that, you take people out of the ball game. One of the contributing factors to rising cost is the number of times things are touched. And every time things are touched, your cost of goods, maybe not in the more traditional sense, you got me? Maybe not in the more traditional sense, but that cost of goods goes up. Our asset light model, and a lot of people are unaware, we essentially carry no inventory. And while some people don't like that, we have to figure out how to deliver that to the customer quicker. That was a zoo lily problem. Sometimes it took them 30 days to get it there. We have to figure out how to get it there quicker, and we have to figure out how to take it back quicker. But every time that product would go from the vendor to a warehouse, to another warehouse, to the customer, then back to the warehouse, and make all these moves, people weren't calculating appropriately the human capital associated with that touch. And so part of my goal is to drive down prices, not just by driving down your margin. You can drive down prices by being more efficient. You can drive down prices by figuring out where to centralize product in a way that makes the distance to get there shorter and the time to get there shorter and the cost to get there lower. That is going to be our biggest challenge in the next 36 months as an industry. That's where we have to spend a disproportionate amount of our money. How do we touch it less, drive down the cost, and improve the experience? If you can solve that, then all the vendors in the room, you are the experts in designing product. You are the experts at creating things. Our job is to help you facilitate that process to the customer and back and have the least amount of friction, with the highest NPS. We don't talk enough about NPS scores. We're gonna, that's why we put Carlicia in this role. We have to have the customer. The customer will pay a little more if the experience is superior. Not a lot more, a little more. That little bit is the difference between making a terrible margin that doesn't allow you to pay your lights and being able to pay your lights and Christmas decorations. That's the big difference for me. I'm sorry to all those. I know there's more questions here, but unfortunately, we've got to move on. If you, you have you questions. You are able to access all of us. So I'm Marcus at beyond.com. Chandra at beyond.com. C-H-A-N-D-R-A at beyond.com. Yeah. First names only. So mine's D Ballum. So D, what up? D is, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. I have a voice that projects good. So um, D Ballum, so D, B as in boy, O-L-L-O-M. At beyond.com. Or you can look me up on LinkedIn. We're going to get you debit beyond. You want to get me something we're cooler? Get we're going to get it. Marcus. The most important, the first name only the most club. important person in the room. First name only club. I'm so excited. Marcus, Chandra, Deb, thank you so much for your time. I, I know this industry is rooting for this right now. Thank you.